OK, thank you very much. Uh, alors, bonjour. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to all of you to this uh, webinar on postgraduate programs. My name is uh, Denise Amio, and I am the CEO of Colleges and Institutes Canada. And it's my pleasure to say a few opening remarks uh, today. Alors, pour les participants francophones, cette session est offerte en anglais avec interprétation simultanée et vos questions et commentaires seront bienvenus dans la langue de votre choix. So first, I want to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this virtual event today. Uh, it is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. As you will learn today, Postgraduate programs have been a topic of interest for us at Colleges and Institutes Canada for quite some time. And we can finally share some of our insights that we have obtained through our internal uh, research that we conducted. So those of our members that offer them or intimately familiar with their own postgraduate programs, of course. Yet, when we mention the merits of these programs at the federal level, you may be surprised to know that we have been unable to provide the level of details to match the level of interest. The interest is strong, Uh, first, because these programs intersect advanced learning and applicable skills. Yet the questions remain because little is known about the national picture until, in fact, today. The research we are presenting is part of an ongoing uh, effort from Colleges and Institutes Canada to showcase in detail how our members are actively responding to student and industry needs in shaping the skilled labor force of tomorrow. And we know that with the shortage of uh, skilled employees, this will only increase. There will be more and more people that will want to pursue education, hence the importance of the postgrad. So, uh, and uh, those postgrad are also important tool, as you will see today, in bridging newcomers to labor market shortage, a critical risk in many regions across Canada. So with those remarks, let me introduce today's presenters. So from Colleges and Institutes Canada, Holly Skelton, who is the Director of Planning for Canada, Andrew Champagne, who is the Manager of Mobility Programs, and Peter Serras, who is Senior Research Analyst, Strategy Governance and Research. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Vinay Chaudhry. Vinay is the founder and the CEO of Worldwide Educa EduConnect. It's a professional marketing services company that provides marketing and administrative support to public educational institutions and corporations. It also acts as a regional hub to provide outreach and admission support to the student population in South Asia, Central Asia, Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, and they also have offices located in Asia, Africa, and North America. In the past 12 years, Worldwide EduConnect has helped to recruit around 90,000 students to Canada. Uh, and MB uh, Vinay is also a postgrad from uh, Western University, but a proud recipient of an honorary diploma from Fanshawe College. So, Holly, the mic is to you now, or the screen. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Denise. And it's it's a real pleasure to be here today to share some of the excellent work happening at Colleges and Institutes Canada. Um, I think first I'll just share 
a little bit about what, what drew me to this research. And it's really, um, as Denise mentioned, uh, I'm the director of uh, what a pre-arrival program, which is called Planning for Canada. Um, and so this focuses on skilled newcomers uh, arriving to all parts of Canada and their needs. So um, that particular audience, and then uh, with, with conversations with colleagues around um, another extremely important group uh, from an international spec perspective, and that's international students. So as Denise mentioned, these are, um, these are a really important and innovative set of programs. And how, how do, do these different international audiences learn about these programs? Where can they find information? So that's part of what we were trying to achieve with this research is that meeting the particular needs of that audience as well. So we're, we're interested, of course, in the, um, the national picture uh, with our membership from coast to coast to coast. And it's a very exciting challenge to try and translate Canada's education system at a national level and particularly for international audiences. Um, of course, we're always interested in trends uh, shaping the development of these programs and other programs. And um, as Denise mentioned, this is a very active part of the post-secondary education landscape. So there are a lot of trends to be aware of. Um, and of course, we want to deepen our own understanding of the post-secondary education uh, sector, and we want to share with our members. So I think this is, this is a really uh, wonderful thing that we can do together because of course, uh, you all know your own institutions and your provincial landscape but you may be less aware of other provinces and territories and what their, uh, what their offer is. So if we turn to um, the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about the growth and en en enrollment as we move along. So um, why, why, why post-grad certificates? Oh, we have the slide in French, which is nice. Uh, so what we see, um, some things that drew our attention here, of course, as I mentioned, the international perspective. Um, but it's difficult to miss the uh, exponential rise in enrollments in these programs. And of course that goes hand in hand with the rapid expansion. And so this, this I find um, really looking forward to digging in deeper uh, as we move forward with this research to understand um, the focus, the areas of study that we see as being extremely common. Um, one of the, Next areas is looking at labor market outcomes and understanding any particularities for um, particular areas of study. So um, does the rapid expansion match changes in the labor market? And, and how does that map geograph geographically across the country? Um, my colleague, Andrew, will speak about this a little bit later on, but this is, um, uh, this is a part of the post-secondary education landscape that has purposefully been opened up uh, for innovation by the provincial ministries of education. Um, so this was a trend that I believe began around the 2000s, where we saw the creation of a lot of applied degree programs. And also uh, we, we started to really see more and more of these post-grad certificates and diplomas. Um, and as Den Denise mentioned, um, you know, especially regarding speaking about uh, skilled newcomers, they're not starting their post-secondary education journey. They're continuing it and they're translating their prior education and experience into the Canadian labor market. And these programs um, are very much building on existing qualifications. And I, I think this is something that we'll come back to a little bit later in this presentation. So on the left, you have uh, two, two uh, charts, uh, one in orange and one in blue. And this just tracks the growth and enrollment in these programs over a three year period. Uh, my colleague has put in the very technical StatsCan term. Uh, so in English, it's post career technical or professional training programs. So this is uh, how StatsCan classifies these programs. And of course, we like to use StatsCan data whenever possible for the full national level picture. So in orange is just total enrollments, all students. And below is in blue. Um, so you, both lines are trending upwards, uh, but the growth in the blue line is over 100%. And so if we plotted that out up until this year, perhaps before COVID, 
uh, the pandemic situation, I'm sure we would see a continuation of that line and the sharp upward trend. And in fact, uh, this growth in these particular programs for international students is even stronger than the overall growth that we see. So there's, these are obviously very important set of programs when we speak about international students. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so uh, the research thus far, um, this is, we just completed phase two over the summer. Uh, phase one was completed last spring, just uh, sort of the outset of the pandemic. Um, and we do have some future phases that we would like to pursue. And we'd very much like the opportunity to speak with you uh, about how we can do that, uh, the next phases together. So just quickly, the first phase was an environmental scan. Um, we worked with an expert consultant from the post-secondary landscape uh, who conducted a series of structured interviews with um, a dozen or more key stakeholders. So representatives from member institutions, uh, provincial regulatory um, frameworks, experts, uh, Council of Ministers of Education of Canada, international education experts. And so we ended up with a, with a very nice internal report um, that provided some key insights that, that then led us on to uh, the phase two and future phases. Um, this, this is not a very well documented part of the post-secondary education system. There's not a lot of literature available. So these first person interviews were essential to, to better understanding um, the, the lay of the land. Um, so just to, uh, my colleague is gonna speak a bit more about this after, after um, but we, in this environmental scan, we looked at uh, the history, when and where these programs first emerged. Um, and again, for myself, there seemed to be some links early on with um, immigrant bridging programs. Um, we looked at the credential frameworks in the different provinces, um, and we looked a bit at the provincial data. Um, so when we look at phase two, uh, this was a very much a uh, quantitative exercise. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, this was com completed by my, my colleagues here, Petter and my colleague PJ. And so this, this was a, a very extensive exercise, uh, to say the least, that took several months. Um, so it, it, it um, came about in four phases. Uh, so first off, it started with uh, data collection from member websites. Sounds simple, right? except there's more than a hundred websites and all the websites are structured very differently one from another. Um, then it moved on to a data cleaning exercise. Uh, after the data was, we'd remove duplicates and that, that type of thing, uh, extraneous data, there we moved on to data categorization and tagging and finally analysis. Um, one of the significant challenges when we look at these programs is around the terminology or the nomenclature. Um, so they're known by a lot of different names. <laughs> um, so uh, we have post-diploma certificates, post-baccalaureate certificates, post-graduate um, post certificates, uh, advanced certificates, advanced diplomas, attestation d'études collégiales. There's really, like, going by the terminology, there's not a, it's not possible to say, oh, this name, it must mean this. But in fact, uh, as we mentioned, these are programs that require some prior post-secondary education before entry. So that's the, that's the hallmark of these programs. These are not uh, entry, they're not entry level programs. Um, so uh, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, that's, that's what we looked at. We, we went through um, while doing this exercise, we also talk to, took the opportunity to look at the other programs um, and all of that will go into updating our program database and my colleague P Petter or, or PJ will share the link to the program database where you can see uh, the list of all these programs. Um, so we ended up with 10,000 programs in total, which we then had to whittle down um, and we were looking specifically for uh, the, the post-grad certificate program. So those that required some prior post-secondary education upon entry. Um, the, 
um, we were looking at as much information as we could possibly reliably collect. So we wanted to know um, what the um, entry requirements were, what were the uh, com components of the program, how many courses, uh, was there work integrated learning opportunity, um, what other services and supports are available with these programs, um, how much do they cost? What are the entry points? So we collected all of that information um, and we tried to keep as much of it as possible, but in certain areas, there wasn't sufficient data. So we have some, some bits and snippets of data that could become more robust over time. Um, so this was a, a fairly colossal exercise, I would say. I'm very, uh, very impressed uh, with the work that Petter and PJ have done, and they're gonna share in detail some of the analysis of, of that research. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Andrew. Thanks, Holly. So um, again, just to put, uh, put, put some of this into perspective, uh, you know, I am um, uh, the manager for mobility programs here. I, I support a lot, a lot of the work that we do within the association with regards to international students. And, and in all of the uh, experience that I've had, um, you know, working with member institutions, engaging directly with students, um, postgraduate programs have always been um, uh, proven to be a very interesting and uh, attractive um, part of the, the college offer. Um, and it became, you know, very clear that uh, we had something that was, uh, you know, somewhat unique in an international uh, context. So, you know, looking at the origin and, and characteristics of all of this, we, we, we took a particular focus on uh, the three provinces that you see on the screen here. So Ontario, British Columbia, uh, and Alberta. And, and these are the three provinces that really drove the, the early development of postgraduate uh, programs. Uh, we'll, we'll use that term uh, to, to cover the various nomenclature that we see across these provinces. But postgraduate programs, they really started in the early uh, 2000s, uh, though um, there were some uh, programs developed uh, in Alberta um, in the, 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 the late 1900s, so, you know, 90s and 80s, um, that had a bit more of a focus on the healthcare sector. But um, there were some common factors that kind of came together um, to incentivize, um, you know, provinces and institutions in these provinces to, to go forward with the development of these programs. And and it kind of boils down to, you know, demand from industry for, for job ready skills from post uh, secondary graduates, um, demand from university students for a bridge to the labor market, uh, demand from college graduates for a focused set of skills. Um, and, and as Holly mentioned, openness of provincial governments to, to innovation. And subsequently, they, they tend to be, you know, these programs tend to be vocationally focused and are usually intended to give students with prior post-secondary education more advanced skills to bridge to the labor market. So they're generally relatively short in duration and often have uh, a work placement component. Um, obviously, um, very attractive to, to Canadian students um, who are looking for, um, you know, more hands-on um, uh, experience at the post-secondary level, perhaps having graduated from a, from a program um, that did not provide them with a, an opportunity to do a work integrated learning component or a co-op. Uh, and we often hear from, from colleges that, um, you know, the university next door is a, is a um, provider of many students who come into these postgraduate programs. But if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk about um, Again, some of the, the external factors uh, or surrounding factors that uh, supported um, the development of these programs or the emergence of these programs. So in the um, sort of, you know, early 1990s, there was a, a really focused or concentrated call for more college uh, applied research funding. And national sector councils, um, uh, again, focusing more on sector specific training opportunities industry demand from increasingly complex engineering jobs um, where it became you know quite obvious that um, in order to um, uh, ensure that you know these industries were functioning properly students needed more specific skills or more uh, targeted skills um, that perhaps um, you could gain outside of the context of a, of a full four-year degree um, 
there again, there was also a, a lot of flexibility by provincial leadership to allow for rapid adaptation to industry demand. So it all comes back to um, really the, the raison d'être or the purpose of the Canadian college system uh, to really meet the needs of, uh, of the labor market in their local communities um, and in line with, uh, with provincial needs. So when we look at the benefits, um, you know, really for students, high interest, both domestic and international, um, and these programs typically lead to a, a good financial return. This is something that, um, you know, we, we know um, anecdotally some evidence uh, and data provided by, by colleges uh, and institutes, but uh, something that we'd like to continue to uncover and unpack uh, over the course of this research. Um, and you know, um, another benefit is that both the institution and faculty gained access to more, um, um, more prestige, so to speak. I mean, it was a it was a really interesting offer um, and unique offer, as I mentioned, in the context of what was available uh, to students overseas. Um, engaging faculty um, in teaching more advanced level programs uh, and again you know responsiveness in meeting industry and student demand for advanced skills in the labor market uh, i mentioned earlier that um, you know the postgraduate programs are uh, very attractive to international students and there's been a, a, a large um, you know growth in these programs uh, over the course of the years particularly um, from from that group of learners so when we look at benefits, um, more specifically for international students, um, you know, many, um, and we can go to the next slide here, but many of the same results were, were evident uh, among international students. However, there was a set of added benefits that proved to be particularly attractive to this group of learners. And this is all at the same time where more and more students were looking at options uh, overseas. Uh, to obtain a second or, or graduate degree. So really coincided with a, um, an increase in uh, student mobility more generally uh, around the world. And these programs really offered a, a lower price, a high impact alternative to, um, to, to, to what can sometimes be a very costly, um, you know, master's degree um, at a, um, you know, at a university level. Um, and a very good return on their investment in the sense that students are able to graduate with a set of skills or a particular focus that allows them, um, uh, you know, to, to more easily transition to the labor market. Um, and again, that labor market orientation um, increased the attraction of, of this um, particular set of programs uh, and added another layer of, um, you know, interest in terms of, um, you know, having a pathway uh, to permanent residency uh, and immigration. So we'll take a pause here to, to ask a, a bit of a question or do a bit of a poll. So um, feel free to um, uh, yeah, respond here uh, on the screen. But so in your opinion, where do postgraduate programs hold the most potential for positive impact on the Canadian economy? Uh, a, providing advanced skills, uh, skills training for Canadian graduates and contributing to job readiness providing a pathway for skilled immigration in areas with uh, labor market shortages um, or, um, you know, and if comfortable, please share some of your additional thoughts uh, in the chat. So this will be open for a, um, a few seconds here, 30 seconds perhaps, and uh, we'll share the results uh, with you uh, when they come in. And with that, um, once the poll closes, I'll, I'll turn it over to Petter, um, who will kind of dive into the, the data and the findings from the research in a little bit more detail. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and uh, thanks everybody for, for being here today. Let me just switch my notes over quickly and. Uh, so you'll find that uh, the data that I'm going through uh, or going to be going through right now is uh, really is set on the, the backdrop that Andrew just provided. And uh, you've heard a little bit about the methodology we used from, from Holly and the background of why we're interested in this. Uh, and we're really trying to triangulate between a, a few different uh, uh, ways of looking at this. So we've looked at sort of the history. Uh, this is our look at uh, the programs that are available. Uh, we're also interested in uh, some of the next steps, which will be, you know, understanding the student angle and the uh, the uh, the market interest from industry. 
So <clears throat> you might find that uh, you know you'll you see a lot of the uh, the information that we're looking at today in your own uh, situations at your uh, institutions, like Denise mentioned, you're intimately familiar with your own offerings, and it'll likely match a lot what we're seeing now. But uh, this is uh, really groundbreaking, looking at it from a national level. So, uh, as uh, as Holly mentioned, we uh, yielded a, 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 a overall list of about ten thousand programs across the, the country, which we whittled down to uh, just over one thousand postgraduate programs. Uh, you'll see on the screen a bit of a regional breakdown, and Ontario leads this distribution uh, rather comfortably with almost 700 programs far ahead of uh, uh, the next levels. Uh, and to give you some sense of comparison, when we last counted uh, uh, these type of programs in 2019, we counted less programs in every region except for Yukon. Now, uh, we attribute most of this to a growth, uh, but do note that uh, some differences observed uh, are not necessarily just due to the increase in programs, but also a slight change in methodology. Um, <clears throat> so uh, going to the next slide, uh, the methodology relied heavily on, uh, as Holly mentioned, uh, looking at the requirements of these programs. So we went into the, the uh, uh, research with the assumption that programs would be mostly aimed at uh, degree graduates. And it was this was true, but uh, we also noticed that over half of the programs accepted college graduates uh, or even those with a mix of work experience and partial education. Uh, so there was, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways that these programs are flexible to really provide skills to, to people that already have some skills and uh, to build on those. Uh, in addition, we also noticed that most of the programs mentioned some form of language requirement. And this was the most direct uh, nod we, we saw towards international students. They're really angled at, at students from across the board, uh, including Canadian students, obviously. Um, we uh, also included uh, 16 programs from Quebec that require uh, partial uh, uh, post-secondary studies rather than a full credential. And this is because these types of programs aren't, uh, they're, they're less defined in Quebec. Uh, so they're included in that category of ARCS, the Attestation d'Etudes Collégiales. And it's a wide range of programs in that. Uh, looking at program length in the next slide, um, we've noticed that a, a majority, not a majority, but a, a large part of these uh, tended to be just uh, around one year in length. And a, a small number of programs also mentioned the length of two, two years. You'll note that uh, we didn't find data for every uh, program here. Um, and this is uh, of course due to the data sources that we're looking at. Now, uh, this, this idea of the length of the program, it has important implications for particularly international students that are considering the pathway to immigration uh, where a two year program would actually be preferred uh, compared to uh, what we assume uh, would be the interest of Canadian students that uh, would be interested in a faster pathway into the light labor market where uh, uh, you know a one-year program would be more useful. Uh, we also looked at work integrated learning uh, as Holly mentioned and that'll be in the next slide here. You, you notice again the sort of an ongoing trend that uh, no data available uh, for a large part of these programs but uh, uh, as you see uh, uh, a large part also did mention work integrated learning and what we looked at were uh, a, a, a range of things like field placements, co-ops, internships, uh, and so on. So there's a, a variety on how this work integrated learning is offered, uh, likely catered to the specific area that uh, this, uh, this program is in. Um, and uh, we also want to note that uh, just because it's not mentioned, uh, uh, so there's no data available, that doesn't mean that there is no uh, work integrated learning offered in these programs. It just simply means that we weren't able to determine it. Um, so uh, looking at pro program intakes, uh, so this is also uh, an important uh, thing to look at for these, uh, you know, in terms of flexibility. And again, of course, not a lot of data available for uh, all these programs, but uh, uh, the trend seems to be to a fall intake uh, and also some overlap in terms of uh, accepting a, an ongoing intake, which is something that we see that's uh, quite uh, special about the college system. Um, now, a majority of the work that we did was looking at how these programs break down by sector. Uh, so we used the classification of instructional programs, uh, SIP, for those of you that are aware of it, uh, to apply to these programs and categorize by, by word matching. And we found that the, uh, the, the top four programs um, are in, in business, in uh, health, in IT, and then communications and, and journalism programs. And then there's a, a, a large group of other, of course, as well. Now we applied the same method to the list that we had from our previous uh, 
uh, search in 2019 and found that the uh, proportions were largely the same. Uh, and of course, the top uh, four programs, uh, program types remain the same as well. So uh, thinking back to where we started today in the, uh, the history of these programs, you might note that we're not talking about engineering or applied research programs here. And uh, this is an important note because they, they get missed when we categorize in these broad categories. Uh, we did look at uh, individual level programs, of course, because these are all, the, all these data comes from, you know, rows and rows of indi individual programs. And we uncovered a wide variety of uh, these specific engineering applied research type programs in this uh, research. Uh, you know, some examples include uh, applied energy management, electrical motion and control management, environmental engineering and applications programs. These all sound very difficult to me, <laughs> uh, but they're highly skilled programs. And we also uh, noticed that there were highly specialized programs in areas such as indigenous financial management, sustainable fashion production. And I have a, a little bit of a favorite uh, myself is uh, in uh, commercial beekeeping. So maybe I'll switch career paths and, and take up that at some point. Uh, we also went a little deeper into subcategories for uh, a couple of specific uh, topics. We looked at uh, health professions and computer and IT programs. And uh, we revealed that, that uh, these postgraduate programs, um, they uh, provide graduates with skills in um, administrative and man management skills and nursing skills and programming skills and uh, very specialized skills in diagnostics. Um, so this part of the study would be very interesting to follow up by applying a regional dimension. And our hypothesis is that uh, the specific, specific health programs or IT programs are offered where there are uh, labor shortages in, in both those, uh, those areas. Now, to sort of sum up all this data, and uh, you know, we can take more questions about this later, of course, because there's obviously details that are uh, you know, more interesting than other people in, uh, and across this, the, the range here. But uh, just in general, we saw that there's, uh, there's been a strong growth in both the number of programs offered nationally and the number of students enrolled. Uh, for international students, the added benefit of a pathway to immigration has likely been a determining factor in all this. And uh, just uh, speaking back to the, uh, the, the data from Statistics Canada, um, we think that uh, you know, not all the student numbers are revealed in this data because as we've you know, spoken about at length in this uh, webinar today, uh, categorizing these programs is very difficult and uh, you know, fitting them into uh, pre-existing categories becomes a hard task. Now, we also looked at, uh, of course, the Ontario and BC and Alberta uh, or origin story. And these three province, provinces have uh, retained their advantage in terms of the number of, uh, of programs offered. And it is where the, a lot of the growth happens. Uh, and a majority of these programs offer a quick turnaround of, uh, of one year and a strong number of them include work integrated learning uh, as well. And then we noticed that, of course, as we just mentioned, one in three programs provide skills for business management and administration. And of course, significant portions provide skills in health and IT. And uh, as I mentioned, many programs are very highly specialized. Uh, I'm just going to pass the mic back to Denise for some concluding remarks, and then we'll move on with the show. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. So as you can see, uh, this is really groundbreaking overview because it's national. And of course, it reveals that more research needs to be done. Uh, we know little about the labor market outcomes uh, of postgraduate students right now. However, uh, a recent Statistics Canada data reveals that graduates of these programs in Ontario specifically earn less than those in other regions. Why? We, we are also uh, expecting an upcoming uh, Stats Canada research piece that will show the student side of our research, and that should be very interesting. And we, we also know that sector and region specific deep dives, similar uh, to what Peter just showed you for health and IT, would help understand the underlying nuances and help further identify what specific skills these programs impart in their learners and why do they want to take those. So uh, on another uh, level, 
our research shows the increasing prevalence of these programs. And despite regional differences, we know that they share important similarities. So this further suggests that they are definitely meeting an important demand among students, but also employers. So for us at Colleges and Institutes Canada and for our members, the question is, how can this help us prepare for the next five years and the future beyond that? So I'm leaving you with three key points. So first, there remain key labor market gaps that have only been exacerbated by the pandemic and postgraduate programs we know provide an important means to close these gaps. Second, Canada continues to be an attractive immigration destination for skilled newcomers. And we know that postgrad uh, programs give us an advantage in this area, especially as a way to help the quickly transition to the labor mar market, because those programs are focusing on in-demand skills in a Canadian context, a bit like the micro-credentials do, but on a shorter uh, uh, time frame. Third, the cooperation in this area is crucial, uh, especially when we talk about uh, skills recognition and emphasizing the unique qualities of these programs and generating cutting edge labor oriented program content. So our organization is committed to strengthening the system. That's our mission. But what we want to do is continue to drive knowledge and help members build their own capacity to design and deliver uh, relevant programming in a way that will be not only sustainable, but beneficial for their students and for Canadian society more broadly. So of course, we will continue to advocate for the value of postgraduate programs as a way to help learn upskill and uh, quickly transition to the labor market. And now onto our final segment where Andrew will discuss international student experiences specifically with our guest, Vinay Chaudhry, who specializes in international student recruitment and marketing. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Denise, and thanks, everyone. Um, you know, I think this was a really uh, interesting uh, overview uh, of the research that we've done and, and really, um, you know, challenges uh, so, some of the assumptions that we, we've made. In some cases, um, some of those assumptions uh, proved to be true, and in others certainly uh, gives us other paths of research or further inquiry uh, to, to learn more about them. But, you know, we're very, um, very fortunate to have our, our guest Vinay here with us to, uh, to talk a little bit more about, you know, how uh, these programs have evolved over time and, and how they've, um, how international students have been interacting with them. And so um, I would also invite uh, anyone in the uh, our, our attendees. If you have any questions over this period, please feel free to, to type them in the chat box. Um, if time allows, we will, we will gladly address those. Um, but just to get us started, Vinay, is there anything about the outcomes of this research that you find to be surprising? You can share your views on that. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not surprised at all. In fact, the only surprise I had was, you know, I thought that the number that, you know, we had in the data uh, of how many students are there is on the lower side, I thought, again, you know, it is about how, uh, you know, Statistics Canada is probably categorizing these students that I think they were still underrepresented in the data. But, uh, you know, I'm not surprised, especially in the international context. I think these programs, they fill a very, very important void, uh, you know, in the educational system uh, in most developing countries is very academic, very theoretical. So, you know, this is what students need 
you know, to, to link to the labor market, they need some hands-on skills. And a lot of them, they just opt for these programs because there's lack of these kind of options in their home countries. So that becomes one of the big drivers apart from, you know, uh, their interest in immigration, but also a lot of them, they feel they're at a dead end of their careers after doing their graduations in their home countries and not really know how to use some of the knowledge that they have used, uh, they've gained over the uh, last three, four years. Uh, the, the only other thing that, you know, um, um, you know I, I would want to say here is, uh, you know, out of the 90,000 students that, you know, my company has recruited over last, uh, you know, a decade or so, you know, half of them have been to these kind of programs. Uh, which is also something which is very surprising considering only probably 15 to 20% of the programs uh, in, any, on an, in, an, in any college are post-grad certificates or something like that. So, you know, the, those 20% programs actually have around 50 to 55% of international students. So they are much more important for international students than uh, uh, domestic students. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Vinay. I mean, it's uh, it, it is interesting um, uh, to kind of see, you know, again, the, the interest in, in in my personal experience, having um, you know interacted with 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 several students overseas. I mean, it seems there's um, a lot of um, interest, particularly at this level, for those who, as you say, have had some education experience in their home country, um, and and you know don't necessarily want to go back to square one um, and want to try and build on to something. So. Um, as you say, I mean, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of students who are coming with uh, previous education experience, and, and this is obviously a requirement in most of these programs. But, um, you know, in terms of filling that, that demand, I mean, compared to other study destinations, um, you know, in, in what ways are postgraduate programs offered by Canadian colleges and institutes unique? Um, you talked a little bit about how they meet that specific demand from international students, but um, what other options could they look at uh, in, you know, Australia, the UK, US? Um, does anything compare from, from your uh, experience? Uh, not to the same extent. I would say most destinations have programs which are called postgraduate program, but they are very different from what, you know, in the Canadian context, how we use that term. So the graduate certificates um, in most of the countries like US, UK, Australia, are more like you know a, a master's degree without the dissertation or you know the the, the any thesis. So that's how they they use it. Students still do it, but it's again it's com considered to be an incomplete kind of master's degree. That's how I would put it. So there is nothing which is very which is similar to uh, the way these postgraduate programs or graduate certificates uh, are structured in Canada. And as a, and and to be honest, it's 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 a, gives Canada a huge competitive advantage. You know, we are uh, one of the reasons, you know, we always think about, you know, how important uh, the immigration pathways have been to the success of Canada. But I would say, you know, having these programs actually put Canada in the limelight, you know, even when, you know, before pandemic, when Australia was, we were competing very, uh, you know, aggressively, you know, Canada and Australia were two countries where, uh, you know, the, the aspiring immigrants would look at, you know, they were open to immigrations. And, you know, and we have seen over the last, uh, you know, between 2010 and 2018, you know, Canada was gaining the market share. And one of the reasons was, you know, this innovation of having this kind of program, which fit uh, the needs of uh, uh, international students. And uh, of course, you know, after 2018, you know, after 2019 with pandemic, of, you know, the way Canada responded uh, to the needs of international students put, you know, us in a really, really good position now. Uh, but I would think that you know the program innovation and these grad certs were one of the main reasons why uh, you know along with uh, you know the SDS or SPP program that put Canada in in in, in huge competitive advantage uh, in international student recruitment. Uh, the only surprise I have is that we still see these programs being very popular in you know South Asia, you know, but not in other developing countries because I from what I understand it's. Uh, uh, it fits the needs for in other countries as well. It's just that we have not probably done uh, such a good job in marketing uh, the value of these programs uh, to the students in you know Southeast Asia or Africa. Uh, and I think we should be uh, uh, looking to do that because uh, you know from my visits and from my experience, I have office in Vietnam, Vietnam, and uh, you know in, in Kenya, and I, I see that uh, uh, when we talk to the students, they really need these programs. 
but they really don't see them in the same way as the South Asian students. So that's why they've not been uh, as, as popular. And I think that's, uh, it's good that, you know, there's a good story that, you know, there's still a room to grow and diversify in these programs. Great, thanks, Vinay. I mean, um, you know, you you talked a little bit about the um, uh, again that that driver or the the, the interest um, uh, for students from that pathway to immigration perspective. But you know, and and Petter mentioned a little bit about that kind of interplay between the length of the programs. I mean, we know from a from a Canadian um, you know immigration perspective, you know, there are clear steps that students can take from a study permit to a postgraduate work permit and and beyond and um you know often to to get uh, you will to get a longer work permit you 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 typically want to be taking a program that is that is at least 2 years in length so you know in in what ways do you think that these postgraduate programs um first of all help students succeed in Canada's labor market and is there anything that you think colleges and institutes can do better well, they like from what I've heard from the feedback from the students, uh, most students, you know, have been able to find jobs, uh, you know, after graduating from these programs, and you know, they it, act, that's why they are here, you know, to get access to the labor market and uh, you know to have better careers, right? So that is uh, the main reason. Education is just a vehicle for you know your success, uh, you know, in in uh, in your life. So so. I think they have been really, very successful. And that's why, you know, we see such a huge demand. You know, the feedback loop is, is, is uh, you know, that goes back to the home markets is that, you know, students have, are doing well. And that's why, you know, they, they invite their friends, their cousins, they see, and, you know, they all want to be here applying to the programs. Uh, so I think they have been very, very successful. And especially, you know, in, in the areas where, uh, the, you know, the, the, the te technology side, you know, IT and, uh, is where I see and, and maybe technology in terms of engineering. A lot of those, those programs have been very, very popular uh, uh, because again, you know, the, 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 when they did undergrad programs in their home countries, a lot of them, they did a lot of the theoretical uh, things and they never stepped into workshops, like except for the first semester, you know, in a four year program, you know, I am an engineer for, from India. So we had our, you know, most of our practical training in the workshop was first year and then there were labs but they were really more about design. They were not connected to the industry. They were more of you know, research labs wherein you will do certain things you're told, the experiments that you're told, but you don't really get to try something new. You don't have the freedom, the, the kind of freedom that you get in a Canadian college. You, know, you go in a workshop and it's very similar to what the, the environment that you would get uh, when you are in, a, you know, in actual work uh, in, the, in the industry. So I think that is, uh, you know, has created huge value uh, for international students, um, but in terms of you know uh, things that we could do better, uh, so I have heard three main criticisms about from the students about these programs. Uh, the first one, you know, I've alluded to before that they are very popular in South Asia. So almost seventy to eighty percent of the classrooms, uh, especially in the programs like in IT or a, a business, uh, have students coming from South Asia. So that is, uh, I think, a real big challenge that we need to address. A lot of colleges have become very comfortable because it's a low hanging fruit. There's such a huge demand that they can fill in their classrooms very easily without, you know, uh, 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 you know investing um, in, in, in different countries to diversify the programs. So that has been a biggest challenge. And from a student's perspective, then you are coming in and sitting in a classroom and don't get a lot of exposure to, you know, the diversity that Canada has to offer. Uh, you know, you don't get a lot of contact with local students then you are in some ways in terms of your, your, your uh, uh, readiness for uh, you know, labor market, you are not ready yet. You might have the, the skills, technical skills, but in terms of soft skills, the things that you would gain from interacting with uh, you know, people who have been born and raised in different other countries in Canada, you, know, you don't get that kind of soft skills uh, as much. So, so that soft skill gap is, is, is definitely there. Uh, the second criticism is again, because of, the duration of these programs, most of them are, you know, eight months. You don't have as much of hands-on uh, experience in terms of, you know, going out in the industry. A lot of work-related uh, uh, opportunity work are, are more internal, uh, you know, so the, the component is uh, more, still more lab-based or some project-based. It's not really actually getting a co-op or an internship in, in the industry. So I think 
there is going to be a huge value if you know instead of having an eight month program you move into a one year program but have you know at least two to four months in the industry uh, i know there are challenges in this but i think this is uh, especially for, for 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 international students they would need uh, you know uh, more work placements uh, in these programs and the third and i think uh, 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 another important uh, criticism is uh, which is the way you know we 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 talked about it you were talking about you know the pathway to immigration now a pathway to immigration requires you know a two year you know uh, education in canada to get the benefit of uh, uh, you know getting into express entry uh, uh, stream so but most of these programs are designed like stand alone so a lot of students what they end up doing is they take two programs which are not connected to each other just to have two years of uh, post secondary education in canada so they would take for example uh, uh, supply chain management uh, with an international management they're not linked at all they are doing two different things and the job that they get is based on whatever they did in the second program so in terms of you know they did international management they try and look for a job in international the first year is kind of gone based to be honest and that's where i think uh, the colleges need to really look at the benefits to the students from their perspective it would be great if they would have those bundles you know in mind when they are developing these programs so if i'm having a project management there should be another program that leads uh, that you know the project management credential can lead into so advanced project management right so something of that sort, sort so they should always be kind of they should think through when they are developing and they should be always developed in bundles for the benefit of international students especially this is especially true for uh, you know colleges and smaller communities you know uh, uh, you know a college in gta or a vancouver because they have so many options students can find uh, uh, related programs but you know if you were to go out in northern ontario or some other provinces you know it really is difficult they don't have a lot of options out there so so even if you have less options there should be options that make sense for international students uh, so these were the kind of three things that i think that we need to uh, to work on for these programs Great. No, thanks, Vinay. Um, I mean, I think those are some really important things to consider, and and it's really um, uh, imperative for for colleges to continue to you know improve um, the delivery to meet the demands of the students, be very intentional about diversity in the classroom experience, and you know really make sure that um, um, they have you know the 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 product the service uh, the the education that the students are receiving um, not only meets the skills that are required of them to transition to the labor market um, but also taking into consideration some of the requirements from an immigration um, perspective um, so I'm just going to see we don't have any uh, questions in the chat but perhaps there are some of uh, my colleagues may have a follow up question or a comment they'd like to share feel free to jump in. Thanks. Uh, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Holly. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Vinay, for for sharing that. It's very important. I think the points that you're raising. Um, I was just I just wanted to add um, during the pandemic uh, with the change in discussion around essential workers, um, particularly in the healthcare sector and the labor market shortages and and I think something that we all knew that very large numbers of people in the healthcare sector have an immigration background. Um, so I really wonder, this, this for me is something that I'm really keen to know more about. And I know many of the members offer uh, post-grad certificates in the health sector. So I, I really feel like now is a time that would be very beneficial for us to focus on those programs, particularly around this, this immigration angle not, you know, both for immigrants that are here, uh, regardless of their category, their their immigration stream that they came in. Um, there's so many people that are here that have health credentials that are not recognized and are not able to work in their field. There's a huge labor market demand. Um, so, and then of course, with international students, those that are interested in the health sector, how can these programs help address the, the whole, uh, circuit of issues around credential recognition in the health field and and large labor market shortages. So I, this is something that I'm, I'm extremely interested to learn more about. So thank you very much. Uh, and over to Denise, I believe. 
it's more, <clears throat> pardon, it's more an observation. Um, there are many countries in the world where people graduate, but they cannot find job. And I believe that postgrads, in fact, help to increase the marketability uh, and to distinguish some uh, someone that have a general, let's see, business degree or business diploma. And if suddenly they have a postgrad in data analytics or uh, cybersecurity, suddenly they become way more marketable if they can focus on specific areas that are in high demand. And I believe for members, this is a way to identify what are the other postgrad programs should we be developing uh, for our region? Because we know that there are big shortages of uh, of uh, of labor uh, of um, of employees uh, right now, uh, and so if if we are able to capitalize on those. I think it would make the postgrads probably even more known because even look at uh, Europe, uh, even in Europe, you know, I don't know how many graduates uh, there are in a number of countries, but they cannot find jobs because what they have studied is not linked to the needs of labor markets. So I really think it's... Uh, it has way more potential, uh, both domestically and internationally, but internationally for many countries, not only the typical one where we have been recruiting a lot of international students. So I'm very, very pleased of this study. And I thought we need to have you also talk about, you know, how you see it from where you stand. It's very helpful for our members to begin to see, okay, how, how do I do that? Because I remember your point about the will, the work integrated learning. But in fact, if, if I remember well the data, if I took uh, good notes, it's 42% that have a will component. So it means if I'm a student, it's up to me also to ensure that I go in a program that has this uh, component. And then for the institutions to ensure that they offer this option for students that could be uh, an add-on if you want uh, for students, because I agree with you, it's even better if you, you can rely on that experience. So, Bravo, thank you very much, uh, team. I'm very, very pleased. And with those words, I think we have to uh, uh, call an end to our webinar. We've uh, just hit uh, the one o'clock mark and I think our translator is uh, clocking off as well. So uh, <laughs> thank you for all the, uh, the wonderful insights and thank you, Vinay, for adding the context to uh, some of our research. And, and thank you to all our attendees for, uh, for tuning in today. This has been an excellent uh, uh, session and. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing it live on in uh, our uh, our social media as a uh, recording. Thank, Thank you. you Take Thank care. You. Au revoir. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.